Thing. Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! Uh, welcome to the country that has pledged its public cooperation with the man who's currently promoting bleach injections for human beings. We shall be uh, looking in some detail at that story a little later in the program but and I, I genuinely can't believe one has to say these words if you're just catching up with news from the other side of the Atlantic then please 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 however severe your symptoms may be do not try injecting or drinking bleach despite the fact that the most powerful man in the world has uh, suggested that it might be a treatment for COVID-19 it will kill you full stop Back to Blighty, back to Britain, where, as you have heard this morning, the question of testing um, in some, or from some perspective, several weeks too late, but as we are tiring of saying at the moment, better late than never, the subject of testing has moved front and centre once again. In fact, test, track, trace is the, uh, is the three-word tactic that the government seems poised to employ. And I want to talk today about hope and optimism, but also, of course, about evidence and realism. I really, really, really want this to work. I don't know anymore whether or not I am... I suspect you are as well, but I, I shall use myself as a guinea pig rather than demanding that you do. I, I don't know anymore how much is desperation, you know? How, how much... I think when you look at the polling, at the approval ratings of, of leaders... There's a, there's a degree of desperation involved because we've only got the leaders that we've got. So to, to, to wish them ill, to want them to do badly is palpably insane, right? I mean, absolutely insane. People are dying. People are dying in this country on a scale that is not really being seen anywhere else. We're vying with Spain and Italy for the, for the worst responses or the worst results in Europe. And, and to derive any pleasure at all from that as a partisan political position, to me, is actually sick. It, it's not just wrong, it's deeply sick. And, and I'm getting really tired of seeing it. I'm also getting really tired of seeing people being falsely accused of it. Criticising and questioning a government becomes more crucial and more important the higher the stakes. Imagine Winston Churchill sitting back and letting Chamberlain just get on with appeasement uh, if he felt that it was horribly and dangerously wrong in terms of policy. That's where we are. So I, I really want this to work. And the reason why I mention that I can't discern anymore what is a, a desperation for success, however late it may be, and what is actually my, my usual sort of rational, evidence-based approach to things, I can't tell the difference anymore. Because right now, I don't think it matters whether or not Matt Hancock's pledge to test 100,000 people a day is reached. I quite understand, too, why people are yearning for the certainty that good testing provides. Our pharmaceutical giants like AstraZeneca and uh, GSK, which have no great history in diagnostics, are now working with our world-leading but small diagnostics companies to build a British diagnostics industry at scale. The new national effort for testing will ensure that we can get tests for everyone who needs them. And I'm delighted that the pharmaceutical industry is rising to this challenge and putting unprecedented resources into testing. Taken together, I am now setting the goal of 100,000 tests per day by the end of this month. I am now setting the goal of 100,000 tests per day by the end of this month. That is the goal and I am determined that we will get. As the Prime Minister said yesterday, mass testing is how we unlock the coronavirus puzzle and defeat it in the end. If we now go to, uh, go to questions, the first question from Laura Koonsberg at the BBC. Um, thank you very much, Secretary of State. Um, you've just announced a big new target for the end of the month, but can I be clear that that would be of all kinds of tests? So the antibody test, as well as the test to say if people have got the disease right now. Can you give us a firm date by when any NHS staff that needs a test will get a test? Because in a fast moving crisis like this, the end of the month is still a long time away. Uh, yes, uh, thanks, Laura. The new goal of 100,000 tests a day 
by the end of this month is over all five pillars. Because no test is better than a bad test. Um, so the 100,000 a day is across all five pillars. Um, and I am, um, I'm, I'm, I'm calling on the life sciences industry, the universities, uh, and of course the uh, public agencies that report to me, the NHS and Public Health England, uh, to unite together to meet and uh, I'm absolutely goal. determined to make commitments that we can meet uh, rather than to overpromise. And that's one of the reasons I've set out some of the difficulties and the challenges. I, I don't think he has that necessarily within his control. I think it was, and please, please let him pull it off or, or, or let the NHS pull it off. But if it doesn't happen, I, I can see people already casting that pledge as a sort of political suicide note. I, I can imagine people already arguing that if, if you know, I mean, and, and where's the number? If it's 999,000, is he all right on that? I've got that number slightly wrong, haven't I? If it's 99,999, there you go, pretty Patel, it's not that hard. If it's 99,999, does he have to walk the plank in a way that if it was one test more, his, his job would be safe? Or, or is it 900,000 and he has to walk the plank? Is his reputation in tatters if they do 800 and... Uh, 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 80,000 tests. I should have written these numbers down instead of trying to do them all from memory. But you follow my logic, right? The target is 100,000. The knives are being sharpened for Hancock, I feel. This is an entirely speculative opinion. But someone's going to have to carry the can for this catastrophe, even as they continue to pretend that it hasn't been in many ways catastrophic. Hancock is the most obvious victim. Boris Johnson's reputation for loyalty and honesty is, of course, not something that will provide the Secretary of State for health with much comfort at this time, but with this caveat that I honestly don't know now whether or not I'm just hoping in a, in a kind of patriotic sense that he pulls it off or whether or not I, I've, I've kind of taken temporary leave of my senses, but hand on heart, looking you straight in the eye this morning, I don't think it matters. If, if the capacity is there, and I know what you're thinking, and I know that you're also thinking that this is what I should be thinking and probably what I would have been thinking at points previous. You're thinking, how do we know whether the capacity is there or not if they haven't actually done the tests? Are you seriously asking me to take this shower's word for it? I, I get that, all right? We'll put that in brackets. But if the capacity is there, I'm not sure we can blame Matt Hancock honestly and with integrity, if they're not all taken up. I, I could be wrong. I could be wrong. Maybe you can explain to me why, if the capacity is there and they're not all done, if, if there is the capacity for 100,000 tests a day, but we don't actually find ourselves conducting 100,000 tests a day by um, this time next week, 30 days after September, April, June, and November. So by, by Sunday and Monday of next week, I, I don't feel that that would be curtains for Matt Hancock. I don't even feel that it would be his fault. And, you know, we've had some complicated conversations this week. We've had some harrowing conversations this week. We've had some profoundly important conversations this week, as, as we do most weeks, actually, but the stakes have rarely felt as high as they do at the moment. So I make no apology for going in with, a, with, a, with, a, with quite a nice and straightforward question. If the capacity is there, but the testing isn't done... <sighs> Do you feel that Matt Hancock will have failed on a serious scale? I don't. And that, that may surprise you, but, but it shouldn't. Because if, if you approach these matters in a non-partisan way, if you simply want what's best for the country, then you can give the mother of all coatings to one member of the cabinet while giving a round of applause to another. That's called being honest. It's called being open-minded. It's called being uh, objective, not being blinkered, not basing your attitude to this uh, entire crisis on the colour of the scarf that you've got knotted around your neck. It's that blind bias that leads to the scenes that we saw in America last night leads to a president suggesting that, that I mean, I, I barely, I can barely say the words out loud. That line about Fifth Avenue, I mean, good God, we never thought it would come to pass in such a stark fashion, would we? There is Donald Trump standing in front of the world's media talking about injecting people with disinfectant and bleach while his own medical advisors stare at their shoes in 
I mean, goodness me, that, that, that is just beyond belief. And that's what happens when you allow that kind of mindset that says, I don't care what they do, they're my team and I love them. That's what happens. That's where it leads. So we will continue in this country and certainly on this program to resist any temptations to knot a scarf around our neck and cheer regardless of reality. But I'm conscious that I could be reaching too far the other way this morning. You may be listening to this as a, as a fully paid up member of the Conservative Party and thinking, no, mate, Hancock's really muffed this up. And that, that's what I want to ask you. If, if we don't hit this target that I think he probably, I, I mean, I don't want to say excitedly, naively, naively put it out there. People were so desperate for something they could hang their hat on, you know. There was too much wait and see. There was too much, we're following the science, but we can't tell you what the science is yet. There was too much speculation. People wanted something that you could actually count, something you could actually process. And so Matt Hancock stood up and said, 100,000 tests a day by the 1st of May. And I think that was a political error. I really do. Uh, and and the, the I think the proof of my particular pudding is in the fact that if he'd said we will have the capacity to do 100,000 tests a day by the beginning of May, there would currently be no sharpening of knives. So, again, the phone lines are open and you are more than welcome to tear me a strip off this morning on this one. But again, I, I can't help thinking that that's a pedantic distinction, actually. It's one that we're pretending is important, or at least it's one that we're tempted to pretend is important. If the capacity is there, what's he supposed to do? What, what's he supposed to do? Round people up and corral them into testing centres? I've already heard from people who don't want to be tested for a variety of reasons, whether they're worried about their civil liberties or whether they're worried about um, the government having too much information about them. It's not impossible to get your head around a position that says, I don't want to give my blood to the government. I, I mean, it's a million miles away from where I am, but these people exist. They are among us. And it seems to me to be impossible if testing is voluntary for Matt Hancock to be held responsible if we don't hit the 100,000 figure. And I'm not sure that any of us would want the testing to be compulsory, would we? So I, I hope this is a, a, a fertile furrow to plough this morning. I'm, I'm going to need your help, obviously. But if testing is voluntary and capacity is achieved... Is it grossly unfair to suggest that Matt Hancock will somehow be responsible if that capacity is not fully taken up? Now, you can either answer this, as I have, from the position of sort of political theorising, or, and, and in many ways you will be the holy grail of callers today, if you have some knowledge of, some understanding of, this box-fresh system, it's, it's, I mean, it's not like you'd have been able to call me a year ago, but if you're across how the testing is going to work, how 10 million key workers and their families can take up this offer to have coronavirus tests, how likely it is that teachers and bus drivers um, could be tested if they wanted to be, then, well, well, you know what I'm saying. I, I just feel that it is too easy, too lazy and too simplistic to say if the capacity's there and the testing is voluntary, then Matt Hancock should hang his head in shame if that 100,000 figure isn't achieved. But then again, of course, he did say it. He said it very loudly and very publicly. And if he misses, well, it's embarrassing. Do you think, hand on heart, that it should be any more than that? Any more than embarrassing? I honestly don't. But as you can probably tell, it's not impossible that you'll be able to persuade me to the opposite position by close of play today. Let's get the phones open. 0345 6060973. I, I, the two crucial preconditions here are the voluntary nature of testing and the provision of capacity. So I, I, I don't think that our efforts here will in any way, in any way, address the kind of tabloid fury. It's incredible how quickly they'll turn upon the people that they were championing yesterday. So, yes, of course, if he doesn't hit the numbers, then the, the, the knives will be, the metaphorical knives will be sharpened. But we tend on this programme to go a little bit deeper than that. 
And the question today is whether or not, not whether or not it will happen, but whether or not it will be fair. It's voluntary. The capacity is there. How can it be the health secretary's fault if the tests are not done on the scale that he promised? No, James, it is important because it's, it's more figures that are simply thrown out without any real meaning. Um, Johnson had earlier said 250,000 a day, remember. Actually, I don't remember. It rings a vague bell, but, but I can't pretend that I've got it all uh, uh, filed away and I can drag it back up to the, to the surface of my memory at the, the, at the first uh, request. But I take your point when you go on the humble egg to say it's all just fluff and glitter. Capacity is not an actual, it's a possible, and they promise definites. Uh, and Andrew writes, if the 100,000 target of testing is not reached, it won't be because people don't want to be tested, it will be because they can't easily access them. Now that might well be true, Andrew, but is that Matt Hancock's fault? Would that be Matt Hancock's fault? You see, I, 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 I'm not here to run his fan club, but I just have two fears stroke feelings. One is he's going to be the sacrificial lamb offered up to insulate Boris Johnson from his own incompetence and failures. And number two is, well, it is possible that in the context of the tests being voluntary and the capacity being there, that he wouldn't deserve the blame, or, or, or as much blame as he's likely to get, if they don't hit 100,000 tests a day by this time next week. All of which, of course, is underpinned by a profound desire that they pull it off. And, it, and if you're not joining me in that profound desire, I, I, I mean, I, I, don't, I don't really reach for some of the adjectives and some of the insults that I used to reach for quite regularly. But today I might make an exception. If, if you're actively hoping that Hancock's target is missed, I, I think you're a bit sick, all right? Not, not kind of injecting bleach type sick, okay? not, not abject, abject sickness, but I really think you need to take a long, hard look at yourself. Should we go to the calls? Yes, I think we should. Ben's in London. Ben, what would you like to say? Hello there. I think, yeah, I think it's a, a really interesting point. Um, oh, I, I hope personally so. hope he's... I hope he's not the sacrificial lamb because I think he, of all of the uh, the cabinet, is the one that has, has stood out as as really caring about the his role within it. I, I think agree. he made some political errors. I think of course. Uh, putting a, putting a figure on it was it was an error. I think he made. You can see why he did it though, can't you? You, you can, can see why well, he did yeah, it. Of course, people were baying for it. Yeah. And he's, he's fallen, he's fallen into but the But imagine track. if he'd just said capacity. If he'd simply inserted, yeah. if he'd said by the beginning of May we'll be able to do 100,000 tests a day, whether we can or not will depend upon public willingness, it will depend upon mm -hmm. infrastructure, it will depend upon things over which I have no control, but as Secretary mm -hmm. of State for Health, I will move heaven and earth to make sure that the capacity for testing is 100,000 by the end of April. And he'd be fine. Well, that... that 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 that's my that's where I have a bit of a dilemma with your point. I'm a, I'm a head teacher. Go on then. Um, You're a so teacher. I, I'm a head teacher. A head so teacher. It, Crikey. Head All teacher. right. Hang on. I'm just hang on. I'm sitting up straight and I'm tightening my tie, Ben. <laughs> Carry on. <laughs> <laughs> so so I'm in leadership, obviously, on a much smaller scale than he is. Now I yes. can put the teachers in the classroom. That's me building the capacity, and I can put the students in there. Uh, and it's not good enough for me to turn around and say, well, I did it all, but they just didn't learn. They just didn't make progress. Oh. Someone has to carry that can. Someone has to shoulder the responsibility for tying the whole thing together. And I'm afraid, just as much as I'd love to say, do you know what? The capacity was there. The rest was out of my hands. He, unfortunately, in his position, has to carry this one. And it's just not good enough to say... That how far does he have to carry it? I mean, it, it, it is almost impossible to imagine a member of Boris Johnson's cabinet being compelled to resign for dishonesty or, or, or a lack uh, of integrity uh, or consorting with foreign governments without telling your own prime minister or, you know, the, the, uh, the, the moral transgressions, having children out of wedlock, impregnating, when things that Cecil Parkinson had to resign yeah, for. Yeah, that's yeah. not, that's, that's yeah. not going to happen in this cabinet with this prime no. minister. But could you see no. Hancock walking the plank for this? I really hope not. Yeah. Because as I say, he's the one I've got the most respect for out of, out of all of them uh, in terms of how he's conducted himself. But that, 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 you know, there's, there's going to be a serious investigation, and I think several people are going to end up walking the plank. 
um, one way or another, whether it's but the election. With him, it's going to it could be sooner rather than later, and and it would suit not. Boris Johnson politically to to have a sacrificial lamb. And and you say there'll be an investigation. You can only hope so, mate. And even if there yeah, is, it might true. end up that's in the true. same it, it might end up in the same drawer in Downing Street as that Russia report. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, I mean, there's a lot, know. there's a lot, to, there's a lot to be seen. But I, I, I do feel for him slightly. He's making, you know, really, Only really tough slightly. On and a you, as a, as a, a li yeah, as a head teacher, <laughs> and I like de describing yourself as a leader. I think you're dead right to do that, actually. But, but if I was to quibble, it would probably be to say that if you'd announced that you were going to have a teacher in every classroom uh, and hadn't announced that every kid was going to get a test, then. The, the picture would actually be quite different, but that's a quibble. I don't think it's a, it's a major criticism of, of, of your comparison. Ben, take care. 25 minutes after 10. Anna is in Hastings. Anna, what would you like to say? Nope, I can't, I can't, I don't know if Anna is there. We'll try that line again. 25 minutes after 10 is the time you're listening to James O'Brien on LBC. Um, where are we going to go now? We're going to go to Ravi, who is in Islington, I think. Uh, Isleworth. As, uh, Ravi, what would you like to say? Yes, good morning, James. James, just a quick question. I'm glad uh, this topic came up. I was chatting to my, my neighbour on yes. Saturday, as you do, in the garden, and his sister is currently a nurse in West Middlesex Hospital. Right. And uh, she was told to go to, I think, Thor Park, you know, Chertsey for a test. But right. for one reason or another, she did not attend. So yes. I just said, how is she keeping? So I don't think it's the distance, because from Isaac to Chertsey, probably about 10 miles. Yes. Um, I really don't think Matt Hancock can take the blame if people don't attend the test. Because remember, they're all given a letter with a barcode. So if the capacity is there for, let's say, yeah, to go to these places, you need to have a letter. And then they don't go. The so bar. why did your neighbour's sister not go? What reason did, did, okay. did he or so she give you? This, this is the next question. I can only assume, uh, <laughs> James, I can only yeah. assume this is nothing to say anything against our neighbours. Maybe she just wants, uh, uh, she had the seven-day period, so she was off work isolated. So she was okay. So yes. I just think she, maybe she's in no rush to get back to work. Or right. she's afraid to go and drive. She's afraid to take that test. This is this is a brilliant said, point, Ravi. No, because simply put, there are people who yeah. won't. I don't fancy being tested yet, or I don't want to be tested yeah. yet. And and if that's part of the reason why we don't yeah. hit a hundred thousand a day by the end of the month, I don't think that's yeah. Matt Hancock's fault. He still shouldn't no, have said it. He, no, but 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 the difference is, as you have said, I mean, I'm not a great fan of Matt Hancock, but I appreciate. He's done a good job under the circumstances. James, if you tell me to mm. go and have a test, and I say, oh, the weather's a little bit nice, let me delay seven more days, yeah. how can the health secretary be responsible? Now, I'm not saying that's the case. He's yeah. afraid to go to that thought park because you've got to queue up. Yeah, I, well, I, it's a valid point because we forget the, the 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 what's the word the autonomy of of individual humans, Ravi. And you remind us with the with the example of your neighbour's sister that, that it's up to her whether she goes for a test or not. And if her experience is you know repeated in the millions, then I don't know. I, I, as I say, maybe I'm so desperate for something to go right in the fight against COVID nineteen, as opposed to phrasing it differently. I could say I'm so desperate for something to go right for the government, but that sounds loaded. I'm so desperate for something big to go right that not only do, do I want to give credit to Matt Hancock if he gets the capacity in place, but I feel compelled to somehow defend him from the from the accusations and the scapegoating that will inevitably follow if he doesn't hit the numbers. But but I'm supremely conscious of how far back I'm bending this morning and, and I'm delighted, Ravi, that you're there to stop me from falling over. It's 28 minutes after 10. You are listening to James O'Brien on LBC. We've got quite a few um, uh, different uh, things coming up on the programme today that I'll give you a quick heads up about. After the very latest news headlines, we're going to talk to the rugby league legend Rob Burrows, who is... Oh, he's a really, really inspirational guy, and, and, and um, uh, we've kind of struck up an unlikely friendship or acquaintanceship since he was diagnosed with motor neurone disease, and he's launched a petition to um, uh, encourage the NHS, shall we say, to, to look at a treatment, to look at a medicine that could make an immense difference to the lives of MND 
sufferers like like him and that there are thousands of them so we'll catch up with rob after this and then later in the program we're also going to be looking as promised yesterday uh, uh, at what we can do to keep the national video games museum afloat during these difficult times and staying in matters museum e we're going to look at what the museum of london is doing by way of properly marking or commemorating is not quite the right word you'll come up with the right word during the news uh, what you would put in a museum exhibit to encapsulate the covid19 lockdown i thought that was a lovely idea that was worth finding out a little bit more about but it's coming up to half past 10 the the major business in hand of course is is your response to my suggestion that if hancock doesn't hit the testing numbers but has got the capacity in place and we recognize that the testing is voluntary does he really deserve the bucket of manure that will be coming his way if they don't hit a hundred thousand tests a day by this time next week where we are doing a little bit of I suppose preemptive analysis of Matt Hancock's pledge to deliver 100,000 tests a day by this time next week. Everybody decent, everybody who cares about their, their neighbours or even themselves will want him to pull it off. If he doesn't, there will be a lot of people sharpening their knives and calling for his blood. You might expect me to be one of them, but I'm not. If, if the capacity is achieved and the test is voluntary, then... Oh, I, I don't think he'd have that stronger case to answer. I really don't. But you are, of course, as always, not just welcome, but actively encouraged to challenge my position um, on, on this issue. Let's go to David, who's in Sandhurst, and then hopefully we'll make contact with Rob Burrow, the, the legend of Leeds Rhinos, who's um, arguably now facing the biggest challenge of his life. David, what would you like to say? No. Nope. David's not there either. My apologies for the technical problems this morning. They are, are beyond the control of any any humans. Um, is Rob there yet? Okay, splendid. Rob Burrow is, uh, for, for those of you familiar with Rugby League, he needs no introduction whatsoever. For those of you less familiar with Rugby League, he, he's one of the finest players we've produced over the last 20 years. But it was his diagnosis with motor neurone disease that saw him, well, I suppose, move into an entirely new and unexpected phase of his life and it is it is the um uh, the phase that he's here to talk to us about today rob how are you doing mate i'm good mate how are you i'm very well rob it's always good to hear from you and i know that the the petition that you've got up and running is is profoundly important to you and everybody else with mnd tell us a little bit about it before i encourage people to get online and sign it yeah well Gave the no real effective treatment in the UK for MND sufferers. The one drug in the last 30 years. So we need to explore more drugs um, than one in the US. Um, which is called Neuro, which is in phase three, so deep, safe. Um, we want the UK government to explore making uh, available over you know, so... Most sufferers die within two to three years of diagnosis. So, you know, time is not a Exactly that. It's, 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 it's the, 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 the notion of, of, of prolonging the time you get to spend with your, with your family, the notion of, of giving you a little bit longer. And, and, of course, as with a lot of these things, Rob, and I know you understand this, but for... For the benefit of my listeners, that, that the NHS, or NICE in this case, weighs up the different costs and benefits of, of various treatments. But this treatment that, as you say, is already available to patients elsewhere in the world is, is proven to, to, to provide people with motor neurone disease with, with that, 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 um, that, well, I mean, to put it brutally, mate, it's, it's, a, it's an extension of life, isn't it? it, it it's, it's an extension of, of, of time on Earth, and um, it, it, it's brutal to think that these calculations are done on desks, but I, 
I suppose that they have to be. I'm I'm going to make sure that we push people towards the um, petition. In 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 the meantime, how, how are you? How are you coping with the lockdown? I, I, I know that, that one day to the next with motor neuron disease, things you can have good days and bad days. And yesterday when I messaged you, 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 were, you were looking after the kids and you said you better not come on the show because it'll sound like there's a war going on in the background. That's right. Um, you know what? My voice made me sound worse than I am. I yes. really struggle with my voice but everything else is all right at the moment my balance is a bit iffy but right. over that James I'm relatively good I appreciate my voice sounds yes. really poorly but behind that um Really? You're still firing. You're still firing on all cylinders, and and even yeah, in the course of this, right. even in the course of this conversation, the voice has gone up yeah. and down. It's it's a lot easier to understand you now than it, than it was at the beginning, and that that's a mark of right. how difficult how difficult it is for you day to day. Yeah, the voice changes day to day, and no reason why, but when you tired. Uh, your voice is worse, but other than that, I'm really good. I really appreciate you getting me on the show. Well, yeah. we, we, we're going to do our best to get as many signatures as possible on, on that petition for you, Rob, mate. You, you, you look after yourself, and I'm really, I, I do appreciate you coming on this morning because I know you're having quite a tough morning. And, uh, and it just helps people realise what you're dealing with and how important this treatment for motor neurone disease could be slowing down the progression, it is believed, um, on a really big scale. So I will get that um, petition front and centre on my Twitter feed and, I, and I'll refer people to your Twitter feed and we'll get it out there as much as we can. Rob, look after yourself, all right? Uh, thank you, Jeff. No, it's, it's just the least I can do. It really is. Um, Rob Burrow there, legend of Leeds Rhinos and Rugby League. Now, clearly, and, and I know this sounds a little cliched, but um, I, I think it, it's fair to say, clearly facing the biggest challenge of his life and asking for a little bit of help from you. So I did uh, tweet it yesterday, and I will tweet it again now, um, and you will, I hope, sign it. There's about 5,000 sufferers of, of motor neurone disease in the UK, of whom Rob is, is one. And uh, as you will see on the petition that I'm, I'm now going to disseminate as soon as my internet has cranked up a gear or two, it, it is believed that it, that it will provide a real slowing of the progress of what is an absolutely, it's such a cruel disease, as, as you heard. And I, I don't know if you ever saw Rob play rugby, but, and I don't know if this is appropriate. I don't even know if he'll mind me saying this, but when you see an athlete of that calibre brought low by something like that, and, and as he said, the voice can often be an unfair indicator of how well he's doing in other areas and how well he's coping in other areas. But there's something, there's something so unjust about seeing someone whose, whose physicality, whose, whose, whose athleticism was such an intrinsic part of who they are. Uh, to see somebody like that battling with a, with a disease like this, I find, it, I find it heartbreaking. I hope he doesn't mind me saying that, and I hope that you will take that as a, as a call to arms and get yourself over to that petition um, and, and, and sign it immediately. I'll, I'll get my Twitter account to point you in the right direction in the next couple of minutes, all right? It's 10.41. You're listening to James O'Brien on LBC. And now we're going to go to David, who is in Sandhurst. David, what would you like to say? Oh, hi, James. Well, just Hello. like you, I, I want the government to succeed. We're all depending on that. But I wanted to pick up on the 100,000 tests. Um, it sounds like yes. just another great big number from the government. And It does sound we... like that, but oh, don't, don't go on. Yeah. You carry on. You carry on. Well, I'll shut up for a minute. Uh, I was going to say, you know, how can we believe it's got any science or substance behind it? If, if there was, it probably wouldn't be 100,000. And... It occurs to me, it's interesting that you had that head teacher on uh, just yes. now. You know, if the government sent its Ofsted inspectors into the health ministry and they said, uh, OK, what are you doing about this testing then? And they said, oh, it's OK, we're going to do 100,000 a day by the end of the month. 
the inspectors would say, well, so what? You know, what actual difference is that going to make? Um, you know, you need to be a bit smart about these. Uh, yeah, but you these, can't uh, force people into the classrooms at gunpoint, can you? Now, that, I don't think I'm overreaching on this one. I take your point. Uh, but I, I, I have faith that even if it didn't happen immediately, then if, if they were blowing smoke up our proverbials by telling us that there was 100,000 tests in place and there weren't, the truth would out. Uh, and, and I do believe that, even, even as that Russia report languishes in the bottom drawer of Dominic Cummings' desk. I do believe that the truth will out. I do believe that it has to. Um, so so I'll, I'll, I'll gloss over the suggestion that they might be making it up, if they're not making it up, if the figure is real and the capacity is achieved and the test is voluntary, how can it be Matt Hancock's fault if we don't go? I, I'm not really interested in, in, uh, in whose fault it is, but collectively, no. I just think we could have a, a little bit more of an intelligent approach and explanation with everybody about how this works. It feels like you know we're on the back foot, the, the, uh, the, the explanations that were coming out yesterday and the uh, the test track and trace mantra, you know, that was used every few minutes. Um, you know, the, the, you could, I was hearing this on Andrew Marshall two weeks ago. Yeah. Um, and uh, and it, it always feels that uh, the government isn't up to speed, you know, and it's been driven by the media and the public reaction to things. Um, rather than... Well, look, uh, being, the, the, being the, the broader question of how the government has handled this is um, one which I have no hesitation in, in answering with the word absolutely appallingly. Uh, and, and again, I reserve the right to withdraw all of my support and um, enthusiasm, for want of a better word, for, for Matt Hancock as the facts change and as more facts emerge. But I look at him and I see a man forced to play cards with the hand he was given by the Prime Minister. I don't see a man that got to pick his own cards or even has any control whatsoever over the cards he has to play. Now, I, that might be naive of me. It might even be um, a little bit pathetic of me. But, and you can say you don't care who's to blame or not, but his, his entire reputation arguably rests upon the next seven or eight days. And, and I think it's important that the question that he needs to answer is the correct question. And and if there is capacity for 100,000 tests and the test is voluntary, then if the take-up rate... Again, I'd lead you back, David, to the question of, of what does failure look like? Is it one under 100,000 or is it 10 under 100,000? Is it 1,000 under 100,000? Is it 10,000 under 100,000? Um, not to be glib, but, but answer that question for me, if you would. What does failure look like? Um, well, I'm not sure, because I don't know why it's 100,000. No, but you know that it is. So what does failure look like? Well, I, I, think, it's, I think it's all a bit beside the point, because... Well, we you're entitled understand. to think it's beside the point, but my point is that it's very hard to answer that question, which is why I'll ask you for the third time. Um, what does failure look like? If the, t if the target is 100,000, is, is a failure 99,999? Well, yes. It, well, that's it's just ridiculous, it, isn't it? I think no. we both know how ri we both know how ridiculous that would be if ninety nine thousand nine hundred and ninety nine key workers went for a test, and people were calling for Matt Hancock to resign. We really would be down the rabbit hole. But I, I enjoyed a lot of your points. I enjoyed. I've got to crack on. The time is against us, and it is now ten forty five. Um, a lot of you are sending me screenshots of the gov dot uk um, self referral test for coronavirus page, um, which displays the rather dispiriting message: coronavirus test applications closed. I, I think we're in broad agreement and I have to warn you that if you were to ring me to disagree on this point, um, you, you'd get a very old-fashioned roasting from me. We want <laughs> the government to do well. We want Matt Hancock to achieve his target because to, uh, to actively wish him ill is insane. I, I, I'm absolutely sick. But if he doesn't hit his target, how much criticism should he face? I, I mean, in the great scheme of things, I don't think he should face a fraction of the criticism overall that Boris Johnson is due, but history suggests that Boris Johnson will evade responsibility for his own actions. It's a man who evaded responsibility um, for all sorts of things over, over the years. But I, but I could be, I, I mean, a, a lot of you on Twitter think I've got this horribly wrong. Um, you need to explain why, of course, to, uh, to merit a mention on the programme. Um, Alex 
does well. He says, Matt Hancock had no choice but to set a target to aim for. Much of the questioning at the Downing Street press conferences has been like kids in the back of the car asking if we're there yet. Are we nearly there? Are we there yet? If he was ambiguous about capacity or the number of tests taken, he would have been set upon. For what it's worth, Alex, I think you're right, but, but I don't know that that would... Um, curry much favour as a defence in, in the court of, of public opinion. It's amazing how quickly public opinion can move. It's amazing how quickly political opinion can move. We seem to be entering a chapter of British history now where people in, in this profession, the media, and people in, in politics, particularly on the right wing of politics, the same people who've spent the last few years arguing that economic damage is a, a small price to pay for a blue passport are now the people asking that risking human lives would be a small price to pay, or at least a price worth paying, to avoid economic damage. I, it, it, it's absolutely bonkers. Um, Spence writes, it's worth noting that the capacity has only just been increased to current levels. To double the actual tests on an invitation basis can't happen overnight. So far, so supportive. But <laughs> they should have planned for that scenario and sent invites out earlier again you know the, the, the idea that this can in any way well i'm going to use that word again it's 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 unprecedented right so yeah it's it's easy to see matt hancock as being at uh, one end of the plank he'll be forced to walk in a week but i don't know that he deserves i really don't think he deserves it Ten fifty is the time jonathan is in god's own country kidderminster jonathan what would you like to say Good morning, James. Um, just wanted to put a bit of sort of information to this, really. Uh, my, my wife's a doctor in the ITU department uh, of the hospital, um, and she's been on and off for the last couple of weeks. Oh, we're, just, just losing, we're just losing the phone line a bit, Jonathan. I don't, I don't know if you've put me on speaker or something like that. If there's anything we can do just to, just to, to ramp it up, and, and, and we'll try again. You, you, you might not know that I'm from Kidderminster, so I, I'm going to ask you, what, what hospital is she at? Is she in Worcester? We, we'll, we'll come back to Jonathan at some point. Meanwhile, Jack is in Northwood. Jack, what would you like to say? Yeah, hi, James. There's a couple of things I'd like to say, one of which is that the gap between actual tested and you know, and the capacity. Of course, you have to have capacity in order to test. We, we get yes. that, and the government has, has done that, which is good. The next thing, which I think is... Well, it, nice hasn't, it hasn't done it, I don't think quite, well, it, but it will working, have done by the end of the week. Yes. Let's not beat them up. They're working on it, OK? Yeah, The one I thing agree. that disappointed me, the one thing that disappointed me, you know, and, and the vast amounts of the British public, I think, you know, have done a good job in terms of lockdown. There's huge chunks of the British public, frankly, just really are not following the rules, doing as they please. And then mm. comes something else, and we should call that out. I mean, yesterday I was at a park, and there's this lady walking a dog without a leash, and the dog was pooing on the cock and on the uh, on the grass. Yeah. yeah. So I said to her, I said, "Why don't you put the dog on the leash?" By the way, they're children, and she said, "It's free air, free it's a free park," and that that is the attitude that we do see. It's not prevalent, but it's out there. We should just recognise that that the British public can do a little bit more if they choose to. And, and, that's and that's, that leads us to the voluntary nature of, right. of the testing. I mean, it's just, just it's not to defend, like not to defend the defecating you know, dog. Hang on, don't talk over me when I'm talking over you. Exactly. The, the, no, the, 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 I mean, in our park, you don't have to put... OK, you carry on talking then, mate. Right, just, just, just for a second, just for a second. Which brings on to our next point, which is there is some degree of accountability with the British public, whether they're in the front line or not. If there's a capacity to get yourself tested, get yourself tested. If you are a, if you're a parent, you know, and you're and you're you and you and you're looking for food, you'll find food. In New York they queue up hours for a bit of food. If it requires an extra half an hour Jay, to get yourself tested, get yourself tested. There are ways in which you get people tested. Yeah, I, I, thank you for that, then, Jack. I, we, I, I, we, th we, thank you very much. Then we move across. Okay. Yeah, I I've heard everything you've said. Um, uh, and I'm sure some of it was interesting. Jonathan is in Kidderminster. Back, back to you, Jonathan. Your wife is a doctor. Um, well, you take it away from there. Yeah, so she's been self-isolating on and off for the last couple of weeks uh, due to children having temperatures. Um, last week, again, that happened. So uh, eventually we, we managed to get a test for my wife. Well, rang up and they said, are you showing symptoms? And she said, well, no, I've got a very bad sore throat and I think it was actually tonsillitis. But, well, it could be a symptom, said, well, though. Well, it, exactly, and they said, well, it yeah. could be, but it's not on our list of registered symptoms, so cough, temperature, etc. So they said, "Is your, but my son was having a temperature at the same time. So they said, yeah. right, well, you can't have a test, but bring your son along, he can be tested. 
Uh, that took about a few days, but then that came through this morning. Everyone's absolutely fine. So right. that, that's good. But, but, but I think what it's shown and what quite a lot of people don't get is the fact that unless you are showing specific symptoms, tests are 100% irrelevant. You, you can't just throw out a load of tests to, to every man and his dog who um, said, oh, well, I'd like a test, because unless you're showing the symptoms, it doesn't work. So, no, no, we um, don't. I, I, well, I don't want to argue about the medicine because it, 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 it puts us in tricky situations, but you can be asymptomatic, can't you? Isn't that the whole point? Or you can be but infected, the but... Is, the, the, go the on. symptoms need to be prevalent. They need to be there to show up on a test. You can have a lot of tests that won't show anything. So, no, I, 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 crikey, I, I, mean, I think we both well, need to check with your wife on this one, Jonathan. Well, but, but the test, you don't have to have yeah. symptoms for the test to return a positive because an awful lot of people who've got it are, aren't symptomatic. That's, I thought that was the whole point. And, well, I actually told my wife on the phone, we, we will not be testing you because you are not showing any symptoms. Yeah, but that's different. That, that, that's, that's the, that's the pre-100,000 um, state so the people that can get tests i'm surprised your wife couldn't as a doctor but the, that that was the point before they're changing the testing regime now to include everybody who wants one and they wouldn't be doing that if you needed to be symptomatic for it to work that would be if if i've understood you correctly and it's possible uh, yeah, i haven't I mean, but maybe this is the information that we're not receiving what we understand is that unless the symptom is being shown it's going not going to give you a great no, I, I, well, I think you're wrong, but we'll both wait for, for, for clearer guidance on that. And part of the reason why I think you're wrong is that there's no earthly way that Matt Hancock is expecting 100,000 people with symptoms to get out of bed and drive to the testing centres every single day in the hope of effecting a return to work of people who are actually fine. So you'll get a negative result if you haven't got it. You'll get a positive result if you have got it, but you probably won't go for the test. The more severe your symptoms are, for, for, for really obvious reasons. It's, it, you, we'll, we'll, we'll clarify this a little later in the programme. Before you go, because I get very homesick and I'm missing my mum terribly at the moment, <laughs> whereabouts in Kidderminster are you? Uh, well, just, uh, just down the road in Blakedown. In Blakedown? Yeah. Yeah, fair enough. Well, we're, we're in we're in Hercot, so uh, pr practically the next stop. I'll probably go to um, go to Hagley for your fish and chips. Thank you, Jonathan. Edward is in Guildford. Edward, what would you like to say? Hi, James. Good morning. Um, Hello. Um, it's the hundred thousand target, right? So, yes. I, I remind you, I'm going to take a risk here and accuse you of being a bit naive. Yeah, um, well, don't worry. I've already accused myself of that. James, over the last five years, there was another hundred thousand target that was failed. Do you remember that? What was that? The immigration target. Right. Immigration below 100,000. Okay. Or, or to so bring it down to the, tens, to the tens of yeah. thousands. No one, yeah, no one resigned thousands. over that, did they? <laughs> yeah. Precisely. So what I'm saying is that this is just a... Somebody's taking this out of the hat and just flown it about. Now, um... Well, I would I say that the normal... That that's true, though. I mean, the, the immigration parallel is... I mean, it, 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 it has a number in common, but I don't know that it has much politics in common. Um... I, I would say that in normal times he would resign, and in, really? perhaps in normal political times, yeah. Why, why, why would you set a 100,000 target? Why would, if he thought he'd reach 100,000 target... Because, because why would... if he didn't, he'd have been eaten alive at that press conference. I bet in retrospect no. he wishes he'd said capacity rather than testing. But every I day, agree. I love that, the, the explanation, it was like the children in the back of the car, and there's been some great questions at the press conferences, but this parallel does apply to some of them. It's, it's are we there yet? Are we there yet? Are we there yet? And eventually, I, I don't know but whether this counts as a defence or a description, but eventually he, he kind of had to provide a hook upon which a hat could be hung. He could still pull this off, they could still pull this off, but if the capacity is genuinely there, and... People aren't going, aren't voluntarily going to be tested. How can that be his fault? Okay. Theoretically, yes, you're, you're correct. But how can you measure a capacity? Who's going to prove that there is capacity? Well, then you're in the realms of not believing what you're being told by politicians, which is perfectly fine, but not believing what you're being told by chief medical officers and chief scientific advisors moves us into, into slightly different territory. And it's not a question about, is this the best available policy, where I, I, I think there is some wriggle room here, because as I've explained a few times this week, I don't think that they're following the science. I think they're following the science that is defined by 
the stockpile, by the storage, by the supply chain, and that that is going to be the biggest um, uh, scandal, I think, to emerge subsequently. But when it comes to could we test a hundred thousand people if a hundred thousand people turned up in the right places at the right time, I don't think they'd lie about that. But you know, possibly I'm, I'm indulging in a little bit of flesh-coloured body stocking philosophy, which um, uh, regular listeners to the programme will understand to be a reference to the boy in the crowd, uh, convinced that the emperor is naked, but looking around himself, seeing so many people insisting that he's wearing clothes and that he's not naked at all, that even even the most clear-eyed little boy in the crowd might begin to wonder whether the president is actually wearing a flesh-coloured body stocking. It's, a, it's an analogy I use a lot, but my goodness, it's rarely been as accurate as it is overnight with Donald Trump. <sighs> suggesting that, that, that people might like to inject disinfectant into themselves as a treatment for coronavirus. If, if I need to say this, um, don't do it. You will probably die. But he's the President of the United States of America, and I'm a gob on a stick on a radio station in London, so hopefully many other people will shout from the rooftops that the President has just encouraged people to hurt themselves on a scale that I don't think we've ever seen a political leader well, in the free world, or indeed the unfree world, even even contemplate. And uh, I should have known a caller from Kidderminster would be right, and I would be wrong. It is indeed the case that for these, um, the, the the new raft of tests, they're available to key workers and their families if they or anyone in their household showed symptoms. So I, I think my confusion was probably built upon the difference between turning up at one of these testing centres or availing yourself of this opportunity to test yourself at home. But Jonathan, in, in, in Blakedown, or Kidderminster, for those of you not familiar with the minutiae of, uh, of the DY10 and 11 postcodes, um, uh, Jonathan was, was quite right. And this is all part of the frantic push to, to hit 100,000 tests a day by the end of this month. A pledge that I don't feel, and I hope I can describe myself without anyone disagreeing as a, as a fairly clear-eyed critic of this government, but I don't feel that this is a, a pledge that should be hung around Matt Hancock's neck like an albatross. I really don't. Now, whether or not that is because I have felt sympathy towards the man during this whole um, crisis, or whether it's because I've temporarily taken leave of my senses, or whether it's because I'm being characteristically on the money, I, I do not know. I do not know. Um, I, I'm, I'm in the realms of feelings because there aren't many facts here, are there? And my feeling is not only does he look like a man being fattened for slaughter by his bosses, um, in the case of Boris Johnson, of course, um, a, an immediate superior who hasn't exactly, well, hasn't ever displayed what, what the rest of us would describe as loyalty to, to anybody in his personal, political or professional life, but secondly, from the beginning, and some early missteps for which I think, again, he can be forgiven because everybody else was misstepping in the same direction. But I, I feel that he has been the one who's looked to me as if he was carrying the proper weight of the crisis, you know? Priti Patel inventing new numbers, uh, Dominic Raab, revealing that he'd have to go and check whether or not he'd read the 2016 pandemic preparation um, project report. They, they, they just don't really seem to me to be people who have empathy, actually, or who, who fully appreciate the, the, the horror of the situation. It could be grossly unfair. You know, a lot of criticism of Pretty Patel's facial expressions, which I think is probably unfair, even though I've almost certainly joined in myself over the months. I, I would criticise her for, for consorting with a foreign government without telling her own Prime Minister, uh, an offence for which she was, of course, compelled to resign. But that doesn't stop Boris Johnson from giving her an even bigger job than the one she had to resign from for uh, consulting with a foreign government without telling her own Prime Minister. These are strange times that we inhabit. Matt Hancock, to me, and the bar is low, given that I'm very close to saying, I think I quite like Matt Hancock because he doesn't appear to be a sociopath. But I, I think he's done his best. I really do. And, and therefore, if this target isn't hit, it seems to me that the cudgels that will be heading in his direction will have a distinctly Murdochian tabloid flavour. In other words, an approach designed to elicit the biggest emotional response from you and me, regardless of whether it's true or fair or not.
But I could be wrong. Let's find out. Dominic's in Warwick. Dominic, what would you like to say? Hi, James. I'm going to have to start with the cliche. First time caller, long time listener. <laughs> well, welcome aboard. There you go. Cliche for cliche. Um, so, I, uh, as a, a long time listener, I've heard you talk about these kind of short phrases that the that the Conservatives have come up with over over the last sort of three or four years. Um, and, and, and more the, more the, the break, more the Brexiters than the Conservatives, but they're they're pretty interchangeable now, aren't they? <laughs> Fair enough. So I want to give you uh, another one, which is the no test is better than a bad test. Yes. Um, and it's, uh, it, it, it's a phrase that kind of it, it is true to a large extent, but it also hides a lot of the complexities that come in when you're talking about designing mass testing strategies, particularly when they have a direct impact on the way people then go and interact with the world. Um, yes. So, so what, what, I'm, what I'm really describing is... Test accuracy is important. It's very, very important. And it's certainly true that inaccurate tests cause far more problems than, than they solve. Um, but test accuracy is only one part of the equation that tells you if that test is working or, or if that test is doing what you want it to do. Um, and the other feature that's really, really important is the prevalence of the disease you're looking for in the right. population. So you can think about it a bit like a bag of balls full of like red and black balls and your hands to test. And, and most of the time you put your hand in the bag, you pull out a ball. Sometimes you don't. That's the imperfect test. The right. amount of red balls in that bag, the people with the disease, the more there are, the more people you're going to correctly pull out. The less there are, the more black balls you're going to pull out, people that you've got wrong. Does that make sense? Yeah, so it's not point. just testing. Where, where are we going with this? So um, the, the major problem when you're designing testing strategies like the, like, um, the, the one that we're talking about at the moment, yes. things like having voluntary testing, is you're not targeting those tests on portions of the population where, you sure, where you're sure that they can be effective. And so right. testing, we, we, we've taken a look at, at different um, strategies for relaxing the lockdown measures um, in the UK and how diagnostic uncertainty will affect them. And you can see that Poorly designed testing strategies, even with accurate tests, don't have the desired effect. So yes, I understand that. Like but, but, but I thought I thought you were. Forgive me if I've missed you. I thought you were mocking the um, simplicity of the no test is better than a bad test line. But you you've gone on essentially to endorse it and explain it. It's 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 not really a mocking. It's that it's an oversimplification. And if we purely okay. focus on capacity as the only germane feature then we're massively missing the point and we might be acting okay. counterproductively. Um, and, and so it's the oversimplification. Uh, mo most people are now becoming aware of the difference between antibody and, and active virus testing. What's your um, field? What's your background, if you don't mind me asking? I, I work in risk and uncertainty, risk analysis and, and wow. quantification. I had, a, I had a feeling you might be qualified. Um, yeah, and... and, <laughs> and it, it, when you when you neglect these other features, it, it, it feels like more tests are good. If you're testing more people, right. that must be a good thing. But if you're testing more people, you've also got the propensity to give more people the wrong results. So if we're talking about antibody testing and kind of immunity passport type scenarios, yes. if you're testing more people and telling people they have antibodies when they don't, then you're p potentially placing those people at risk that believe they're immune and then go on to become infected because they've, they've behaved in ways that they and, and this is behaved. this is relevant even to countries that have done a much better job of getting a handle on the crisis in the first instance so vietnam Absolutely. most obviously which vietnam is an incredible incredible example uh, in this field but but even they can't be a hundred percent sure that people going back into the population a, might, it might be possible to get reinfected, we, we, we've read from South Korea and elsewhere, and B, no tests are 100% reliable, so everything is, and this would fit in with your professional position, everything contains an element of risk, even when we're desperate to believe that it doesn't. There's a professor called um, Gerd Gigerenza um, in, in Germany, and he calls it um, Franklin's Law. That right. Only two things in certain, and two, only two things in life are certain: death and taxes. So if anyone yes. tells you anything else is certain, they're just lying to you. Um, <laughs> well, even taxes aren't certain these days, are they? If you're rich, <laughs> 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 well, that, that, the case. Um, but, but, but I take your point. I take your point. So yeah. what? I mean, it, it, I, I've understood eighty percent of what, what what you've told us because you're clearly better informed 
than I am. What what are you most worried about then? That they're rushing out tests before they've got f maximum efficacy? Well, I think I think it's now becoming clear that there are. I, I think there was a Guardian article a few days ago about some of the problems that. Um, I, I don't want to slander anyone, but I think Deloitte has been involved in a in a testing rollout, a rapid testing rollout somewhere in London. I've, I've read similar. There. Yeah, right. Um, th th there are massive dangers to these things, and and when you oversimplify to no test is better than a bad test, or our target is a hundred thousand tests a day. We miss some of the subtleties and the important things that I hope I hope people are thinking about. Um, but it's be increasingly becoming clear that that too much focus is being placed on these features. That not that they're not important, but they're not as as germane as, as other features like targeting the tests effectively. If you can, right. even even a less even a lower quality test, if you target it well, you have a much better outcome than a perfect test or uh, a very good test. Yeah, no, I've got you. Blasted I... over as many people as possible. Yeah, so you're, I mean, you're worried on several fronts then by the direction of, of traffic politically Massively and, worried. And, 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 and medically. And uh, I want to be clear, I mean, I don't design medical testing, I'm not sure. a virologist. There are, there, no, there are you're a riskologist. <laughs> I might call it that. Um, the, there are um, the, the, there are many reasons these tests can be wrong. There are the, yes. imp imperfect swabbing, mistakes in the in the logistics, giving the wrong result to the wrong person, the test just not being sensitive to the thing that you're trying to find. There are many reasons why these tests can be wrong. When mm. you accumulate them all up over a population, the the the, the impact could be far more significant than it's than it sounds like it would be when you've got a 95% accuracy test. I mean, the mistake m many people often make is when you've got a test that says it's 95% accurate, they think, if I, get the, if I get a positive test result, then there's a 95% probability that I have that condition. And that's yes. not the case. No, I, I no, I crikey, AO level statistics now kicking in, and I, I, I didn't really <laughs> understand all of it back then, but the penny dropped then, of course that's not the case. Um, Crikey. Well, thank you. Uh, in, in, I don't actually know, and this will be the 20% of what you said that I don't understand, in a word, if he doesn't hit 100,000 actual tests a day in six days' time, do, do you think he should be toast? Um, I don't think he should be toast for that. I, I, um, <laughs> That's I, I, almost a politician's answer, Dominic, just in time <laughs> for the break. Thank you, mate. Take care. That's Dominic, our pocket riskologist. It's 11.15, um, for which I'm very grateful. I, I've said it a few times, but I, I think I value your company at least as much during these strange times as you potentially value ours here at LBC. We are discussing the testing, which is obviously going to assume ever greater momentum as, a, as both a story and a subject in the coming six days, because it is at the end of this month and effectively the end of this week that Matt Hancock's promise to have 100,000 tests a day taking place will be judged. And I, whether he pulls it off or not um, is obviously the, the, is central to, to the speculations and the conversations we're having today but i'm working i'm working towards the conclusion that if he doesn't pull off the actual testing per day but the capacity is genuinely and crucial word here demonstrably in place then the fact that the testing is voluntary should insulate him against some of the saltier accusations of either I I incompetence or indeed compromise. I, I, I don't know what you make of that. Uh, 03456060973 is the number that you need. We've certainly been given a lot of food for thought by our callers today and there, there is more here that I've just retweeted which is um, addressing my own confusion uh, but, but also perhaps a, a broader confusion about the difference between the asymptomatic and the symptomatic people getting tested. So there's a, a, a piece from um, well, I, I, I've just retweeted it, which explains the mid-turbinate swabs are suitable for symptomatic people. Those are the tests that are being sent out. But you'll need a, an essentially nasal or, or nasopharyngeal swab for um, people who haven't got any symptoms. And, and that can only be done in a clinic setting. So this isn't going to be the magic wand that fixes everything for, for a whole heap of reasons. But in the in the first instance, the new test is one that you apply to receive online it then gets sent to your home and 
um, and, and tested in a lab via post for processing. If it is found positive, then you get a call from the contact tracing team and the contact tracing team will try to establish the patient's movement in the previous days by asking detailed questions. Every person you have been in touch with will then be phoned and if they are at risk, they will themselves be asked to isolate for a fortnight. So it, it's all variations upon models that were adopted weeks ago in countries like Vietnam and South Korea and, and possibly even Germany. I think in Germany, although as ever on the programme, we're open to correction. And, and there will come a point, in fact, we may already have passed the point where better late than never offers up any form of defence for, um, for the slowness of the British government's response. But I've, as I never tire of saying to you, they're the only government we've got, and this is the only reality we inhabit. So better late than never is still true, objectively true. It is better that it happens late than it happens not at all, but it ceases to be a defence of, of government behaviour um, in, in a way that will only become fully clear, I think, when we are over the worst when we're out the other side and, and perhaps analysing um, retrospectively what went on. And then I know exactly what you say at this point. You say, oh yeah, great, we're going to have an inquiry, are we? Remember the Russia report. And I say, well, you know, some of us did tell you what this lot were like. <laughs> if it's taken this for you to realise, then, well, at least it hasn't taken a British politician standing up in public and suggesting that you should inject yourself with bleach, which was the American experience overnight, something to which we may turn our attention shortly. It depends on the timing. Let's get up to Liverpool, though. Harry is there. Harry, what would you like to say? Good morning, James. I'll uh, get the little cliche out of the way first, the uh, first-time caller. You don't have to do that. You don't have to do that. You see? But it's, I, I, I'm glad to have you on board. Better late than never, Sorry. eh, Harry? <laughs> what yeah. would you like to say? <laughs> um, well, I agree with you, um, and I do sympathise with Matt Hancock at the moment. Um, I think, given his, uh, his boss's absence, I think he's got quite a weight on his shoulders. He's doing pretty well with that, and albeit um, he'd come up with quite a, a large smart objective, I think, of the uh, 100,000 tests. I think he had to come up with some figure. Um, yes. And whether he does meet it by the end of this week or not, um, I don't think that should really be debating uh, the continuation of his job. But I do I do feel that um, it does sit with him oh. to, to put this, this testing out there to the public uh, better. I think, That's his um, job as well, not 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 just is, the yeah. capacity, but but access, as it were. Absolutely. I mean, at the end of the day, he set this objective, and I mean, arguably, he is responsible for the the health of the population. And I guess a question to to everyone would be, who'd be a better person to do it in this situation? Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, there's a question for the ages: who would be a better person in in this situation? I. I yeah, so you don't think it would be a sackable offence, but you think it would be a very large black mark on his record? Exactly, yeah. I mean, I think, I, I don't like to think he would What's like wrong to, with me, Harry? Put, why am I suddenly, put, put why am I... Up and think, I've done my 100,000 tests, there you go. Yeah. Open the door. Yeah, and, no, uh, I mean... Get them if you want them. You make a lot of sense, but you're not denting my sympathy and support for the man, and I don't really understand why. I, I mean, well, I do understand why. I've, I mean, the great luxury of being able to explain myself at enormous length on the radio every day. And I, and I know you're right, it would be a mistake, but it's a mistake of his own making. I don't know if this sounds like a defence. I hope it does. It's, it's, if he'd said capacity instead of saying testing, and didn't Johnson say a quarter of a million at one point as well? So why are people, and, and the answer sadly will be in the allegiances of the people that own the newspapers that I'm talking about, or indeed own the people contributing to the newspapers that I'm talking about. Why aren't we all getting our knickers in a twist about Boris Johnson saying there'd be a quarter of a million tests? Um, well, is it just context? It, it, yeah, I guess, and, and that's acting as the front man at the moment in, uh, in Bo Boris's uh, absence, but at the end of the day, I think he set the targets, um, and I think after what you've said this morning about the, the government uh, website and the the limited number of test centres, he should yes. be the man to spearhead that increase. Um, he may not meet his target, and I don't think it should, it should be a moving target. He should continue to build on that 100,000, but well, he yes. should build on that testing as well. So his mistake then, to really break it down in, in, in the broader 
uh, analysis and and bringing Boris Johnson back in to the conversation, Matt Hancock's mistake was the deadline. I guess it is, yeah. I think he's... Because uh, I've got Johnson here at the beginning of April talking about 250,000 tests a day. And, and you know, that in, in classic Boris Johnson fashion, we're all presumably being encouraged to look the other way and pretend that never happened. Well, exactly. And you've got to think about it. I mean, if it was 250,000, if it was 100,000, we don't meet it. So what? Do we stop? No, we continue. We Just kind of, crack we on and hope, hope, and hope for the on, best. Yeah. Give everybody else the support that you can give. Um, I, I hear you. I, and actually, I, I, I did I double check that. Um, brought it back round again because someone mentioned it earlier and I couldn't, I didn't have it at my fingertips. So I've, I've double checked. And I, I, well, let's talk a little bit about that. Harry, thank you, mate. Thank you for your thoughtfulness as well. Because if Matt Hancock is somehow finished, if this test isn't hit, then all Boris Johnson did was, was, um, decline to deliver a deadline. So he said in, uh, and let's get this absolutely right, it was certainly reported on the 19th of March, God, I thought it was further back than that, um, that testing would be ramped up from 5,000 a day to 250,000 a day. Prime Minister Boris Johnson said the tide can be turned in the coronavirus fight within the next 12 weeks as he updated the public on the timetable for restrictions. I'm conscious as the days have gone by that people will want to know how long we're expecting them to keep it up. I think, looking at it all, that we can turn the tide within the next 12 weeks. And I'm absolutely confident that we can send coronavirus packing in this country. And, and then he talks about the importance of testing and he pledges to, by, well, I'll read it to you, by the same token, we're massively increasing the testing to see whether you have it now and ramping up daily testing from 5,000 a day to 10,000 to 25,000 and then up at 250,000 tests a day. Now, there will come a point at which we are able to say, well, that hasn't happened. But because he didn't deliver a deadline in the way that Matt Hancock did, it's almost as if all of the focus has shifted from Boris Johnson's promise to do 250,000 tests a day with no deadline to Matt Hancock's promise to do 100,000 tests a day with a deadline at the end of next week. And, and it, I mean, objectively and logically, that just doesn't make sense, does it? The, the, the danger of delivering a deadline. I don't know. More of your thoughts to come. Will's on the Isle of Wight. Will, what would you like to say? Uh, hi, James. Thank you for having me. Um, so, uh, firstly, I, I sympathise a bit with Matt Hancock. I'm yeah. not a Tory and I probably never will be. Um, but I, I can sympathise. No one really wants to deal with this, but it's quite a hard job and he's probably doing all right. However, yeah. <laughs> care workers on the Isle of Wight, for instance, the places yes. for them to get tested are London or Plymouth. Um, yeah, that look, I mean, that looks like an operational... Snafu. Yeah. You you, you um, can we, now apply if when the website's back up and running, but you could apply for a kit that allows you to test at home and then send it off to a laboratory to be tested. But like me, you're probably thinking why well, you couldn't do that a month ago. Exactly. So if they can do it now, why couldn't they have done it? Um, well, the test wasn't so there. That's why the line, a bad test... No test is better than a bad test, so they had to wait until they had confidence in, in the test. There was talk about international shortages of the relevant chemicals. Again, I'm not qualified to comment on the veracity or otherwise of that. I can only tell you what they, they told us. And, and all of this really, to you on the Isle of Wight, sounds like me so just sort of pompously expanding upon the better okay. late than never soundbite, doesn't it, really? <laughs> I don't think you'd ever do that, James. <laughs> 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 Thank you, Will. Are you a care worker, or are you just describing other people's? Uh, I'm not, but I've got friends who run care homes. Well, there you go. And, and if you know, they want to go for a test, actually get a test, they've got to, they've got to cross the water. Thank you, Will. Look after yourself. <laughs> Thank you for the tongue-in-cheek support as well. It's coming up to half past eleven. Astonishing, really, that we're still having this conversation now. But I, I, I do think the, not the penny drop moment as such, but the big, the big kind of reminder of the day is that while we're all talking about Matt Hancock potentially missing his 100,000 a day promise, people who've spent the last few years trying to convince you that Boris Johnson is a, is, is a leopard capable of changing his spots have conveniently forgotten 
that Boris Johnson said we'd be up to 250,000 tests. It could still happen, and possibly his, his defence will be that he never issued a deadline. But, but if I was Matt Hancock, I'd probably have that tattooed on my forehead in anticipation of not hitting the numbers at the end of this week. <laughs>